situation, sir, gambling is just starting to be legalized, right? And when it was in the United Kingdom, what happened? Let's see. People watch games longer because if you're watching a baseball game and your team's losing 14 nothing in the seventh inning, you're going to turn it off unless you've bet a couple of hundred bucks on what the second hitter in the eighth inning is going to do, right? You're also going to watch games that you have no rooting interest in. So, and gambling is coming, and it's, it's a huge business, and it's going to be a huge generator in terms of eyeballs watching these games. It's going to push up the media rights value. Yeah, look, you, you only need to look at your March Madness bracket to know whether uh, it, you know, even a small investment causes you to change your viewing behavior. It's, it's, it's hugely different. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and Chris, you've got kind of a, a bird's eye view on on integrating gambling into, into some of these other, uh, uh, other revenue streams. Yeah, so I, I mentioned earlier, uh, I have uh, my other company, uh, Simple Bets, technology company. We're actually about five blocks away. Um, and we've, we've invested about $80 million, uh, heavy machine learning, machine, engine, machine learning, data science, automation around in-play micro betting. And we've been at it for about four years now. And, you know, what I'm seeing now, I mean, you're, you're 100% right, like Sal said, the, I mean, study after study after study, we'll see, you know, anybody that has uh, any kind of money on a game, right, is more, is like 97% more likely to watch longer. And that goes back to, you know, like, how the leagues and teams actually get the majority of their revenue is through media deals. So, you know, there's a, we've invested in a product that's called micro-betting, in-play betting. We basically have created a technology that um, allows for in-play betting where you don't have to wait the entirety of the game to know the result. So, in other words, every single pitch, every single at-bat, every single play in an NFL game, or every single drive, every shot, every possession in an NBA game. And, you know, we've seen the product out there now for about a year, and it's driving massive engagement. And this is like just version one of this. I mean, we've, we've essentially taken two and three hour football, baseball, and basketball games and turned them into hundreds of thousands of mini games. It's like turning live sports into a slot machine. And that kind of velocity that goes through it, it's, and it's a, it's a more engaging product, right? Because it's actually something that like a casual fan, you know, like you were talking about earlier about trading and um, you know, the earlier panel here, uh, and it's not like in, in, in play and micro betting, which is a which is a super duper engagement tool that you could be a punter or I mean a, a, an avid better and shop around for the best lines. That's not why you're doing this. This is like how a casual fan watches it. Yeah, I think I'm a Yankee fan too. I think you you're know some of the a person of good taste and high intelligence. <laughs> uh, so when I watch a game and I sit on the couch with my son, I say, oh, Garrett Cole's gonna. This is going to be a fastball for more than 95 miles per hour. I'm betting that right now. Bet $5 to win $7.99. Like, that's what happens, right? So that's how you watch a game. Or I say, I'm a Giants fan. I admitted it. I'm a New York Giants fan. Saquon's going to run for 10 yards or more on this play. Or, you know, Daniel Jones is going to throw to Sterling Shepard for a touchdown. And then you get into the micro parlays. Like, okay, I think Aaron Judge is going to hit the fourth pitch to right field for a home run. Then you start talking about more like lottery type product. Like that's really fun, engaging stuff to, to, to drive attention. I mean, that's ultimately what the media companies want. They want just people watching their games longer, and that's what they're paying for. I mean, frankly, it's how we already watch sports. It's uh, just yeah. now there's going to be somebody that actually yeah. makes sure you pay up. Yeah. 100%. And right. it's like, yeah. you know, what we're really, you know, he's talking about the, the movement from wholesale to retail. What, we, what we're really in the middle of is just the personalization of media. And that's really what data rights and all these interactivity rights like sports betting, it's you're moving from a world where it was a mass media opportunity into a one-on-one -on -one media relationship, but there's all these other things you can do around it, and it can get very personalized. Right. Michael, do you have any re response to that kind of from a, from a media perspective about the... I... I totally identify with what Chris is saying, and it was something that was pointed out to me about seven, eight years ago when the Sacramento Kings of the NBA were bought by uh, Vivek Ranadive, who's a real quant, soft-spoken, but brilliant guy. And so I went out to interview him, and uh, at that time, 
I'm sure Sal remembers the exact price, but it was like 540 million. 535. 535. I, sold it to, I sold it to him, Mike. But it was thought to be a very high price. So anyway, at the end of the interview, I said, how much do you think this team will be worth like in five years? And he said, billions. So I said, excuse me, because he's very soft-spoken. So I said, can you say that again? This is, I want this on film. He said, billions. But he said, Michael, he said, when you do your valuations, he says, you're thinking about it the wrong way. He said, you're looking at this as a spreadsheet with a team with revenue, EBITDA, you know, net income. He says, what it is is exactly what Chris just described. He said, it's a brand with millions of devout followers who want real information on tons of in things in real time, and they want to be able to connect with each other. So I think the bottom line of it is, and, and, and what this means for team values as an investment is, you, these teams are still brand names that are up here based on their followings and their international reach and their revenues down here. And the idea is to get revenue closer to the brand value. Sal, you want to jump in? No, look. There's going to be a bifurcation, all right? Values are going up. But if you have the New York Yankees, guess what? If you put the New York Yankees on the market at an auction, I don't even know what the hell the price would be, okay? Some of the lower brands, bottom quartile in each league, are much more difficult to sell. But there are buyers for those brands. All of the things we talked about continue to drive valuation. So they may, their revenue multiples may go up at a lower rate, but they're still going up. And this is a very unique asset class. There's, there's nothing else I can think of that's exactly like this. One of the things I love about baseball is it's 162 games. Gambling, you have a lot more games to gamble on. You have a lot more specific events to gamble on. And immigration patterns in the United States are a great tailwind for baseball. I don't know why baseball doesn't talk about this, but they don't. Every 25 years or so, immigration patterns in the United States change. When I came here, most of the immigrants that came to the United States were from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe. Then it shifted to South Asia and East Asia. Now the bulk of the immigrant population comes from Central America, Mexico, the Caribbean Basin, Venezuela. Guess what? Those people love baseball. They already have stars from their countries playing baseball. And they don't have to learn English like I did to follow baseball. You hit the SAP button, you can follow, okay? And they know the brands already. They, they have their favorite teams. This is gonna be a huge tailwind for baseball for a while. And baseball's finding ways to, to better market, but I just think the upside is, is huge here across the board in sports.